thank you all so much uh, for coming today. And I am really excited to have a conversation with you today about some new ideas in oncology, which are sorely needed, as we all know, um, that I hope will pique your interest and perhaps uh, 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 put some ideas into your brains and you will help us move these ideas forward and get some traction with treating a very specific area of um, oncology and that's patients with currently incurable metastatic cancers. Now what I'm going to talk about is is very theoretical at this point. It's not ready for prime time but still I think it's important that you hear about it, and um, uh, I think it's important also to know when not to apply uh, these ideas, uh, and we'll talk all about that uh, in this talk. So here we go. So um, uh, we're going to journey today through the evolutionary landscapes of cancer, and we're going to talk about uh, how cancer arises uh, through evolutionary processes in um, uh, between species, um, how, it, uh, uh, how cancer rates vary within species, why uh, fertility and cancer risk go together, you, you don't get one without the other, how current models of cancer treatment can sometimes make things worse, and how a branch of mathematics called game theory um, may help us move uh, cancer treatment in the right direction. So cancer rates vary between species. Uh, large species uh, uh, and long-lived species tend not to get as much cancer. So elephants don't uh, rarely get cancer. The title of the talk is Why Elephants Don't Get Cancer. They actually have a lifetime cancer rate of about 5%. It's very low. Um, mice, however, have a rate of about 100% uh, at their lifespan of uh, two to three years. And humans are in between at about 50%. And uh, the reason for this is evolution. That's the reason for most, uh, that's the answer to a lot of uh, questions in biology. The definition of evolution that we're gonna use here is change in the heritable, heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. There are other definitions, but this is what we're going to work with here. There are some principles of evolution that I'll review for us. Uh, natural selection, fitness, and adaptation. Natural selection is officially the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype. And I would argue that it's really the differential reproduction. Um, because natural selection, if you forget the, the fancy uh, formal definition, answers the question, who gets to reproduce. And when I was practicing this talk, one of my colleagues said, hey, you switched the names on there. I, I didn't do that. that this, was a, this is a movie poster. So what allows selection? You have to have variation if you want to make a selection. Uh, and phenotype, not genotype. Phenotype is what is selected. Um, and that allows epigenetic variation to, to play a role in cancer and other evolutionary processes. And these variations can occur within a species, an individual, or within a cancer. A single cancer harbored by an individual will have variations that allow for selection of certain, we'll call them species in that realm too. Fitness, I want you to throw out, you know, you, this is the ancestral health crowd. You guys are all so fit, it's kind of scary. But um, I'm not talking about the kind of fitness that you exhibit. I'm talking about the ability to win at reproduction. Doesn't necessarily mean you're strong, it means that you're well adapted to your environment. That's it. It means that you are able to extract resources from the environment you accidentally find yourself in. And we all accidentally find ourselves here on Earth. And if you have any um, other ideas about that, I'd love to hear it. Um, but, uh, uh, and we have to adapt. So fit organisms are able to adapt because they have the right tools. If you do not have the right tools to reproduce in your environment, you will not be fit. We have, we think, a last universal common ancestor. Here she is, this is grandma for all of us. This is a bacterium. Most evolutionary uh, scientists believe that the um, uh, last common, uh, universal common ancestor of most uh, creatures on Earth today was a bacterium or a bacterium-like creature. Um, what do these creatures do? They have two imperatives. They eat, and once they've eaten enough, they divide. Eat, divide, 
eat, divide. They are immortal. This is a paramecium. This is a slightly more advanced but single-celled creature. Um, it eats and divides, eats and divides. This is a didinium. I think it's really pretty and delicate lacy. It looks like a lampshade to me. But it eats and divides, and that's all it does. So the one-celled organism has a pretty easy task. It has to stay alive, and it has to divide. It never dies as long as it doesn't get eaten. But a one-celled organism is very, very edible. This is our paramecium, this is our didinium, and this is what happens when they meet. This is the didinium, our beautiful, delicate, lacy little lampshade eating a paramecium. It thinks it's going to get all of that in. I'm not sure how, but they, apparently they do. This is a yeast. This makes your beer, um, and they, divide, they uh, reproduce by budding. These are little buds that you can see on our yeast here in a scanning electron micrograph. Yeast have figured out that there's safety in numbers, so sometimes they don't completely separate when they divide. Hydra has gone a little bit farther. It's a fully multicellular creature um, with division of labor and all sorts of uh, uh, new interesting things. Um, multicellularity is a good deal for cells. They, it's evolved separately at least seven different times. Uh, it allows uh, variations that um, can uh, uh, complement uh, various niches, and it allows sexual reproduction and all the goodies that come along with that, the variations. It also changes the predator-prey relationship. You're a better predator if you are multicellular and you are less good as prey. Uh, you are better off uh, if you're multicellular if you are prey. But multicellularity has a dark side. All of those cells that were previously uh, driven with a program to eat and divide and eat and divide still have that program. That program has to be shut off. It's hard to shut off the eat, divide, eat, divide program. If you don't completely shut it off in a multicellular organism, you get cancer. This is a mushroom with what's called rose comb disease. This is a tumor on top of an ordinary mushroom. Hydra, here's a normal hydra on the left. Uh, here is another normal hydra and on the right is a hydra with a tumor. You can see that asymmetric symmetrical uh, bulge there with the T next to it, that's a clue. Here's a normal saguaro cactus. Here's a saguaro cactus with a tumorous growth at the top. So we've talked about how unicellular um, organisms divide. The current organism becomes the next generation. There's no death involved. In multicellular organisms, only one cell makes it to the next generation, the germ cell. The rest of the body, is disposable. The only job of the rest of the body, which we're going to call the soma here, is to transport the germ cells uh, to the next generation. So what you consider yourself, you are a vessel for transporting either ovum or sperm to the next generation. So um, again, we've contrasted germ cells and somatic cells. The soma, let's spend a little more time on this. Um, uh, again, it, the soma transports germ cells to the next generation, usually via sexual intercourse, not always. There are some variations on that theme with uh, some uh, different types of moss and other uh, plants with very complex reproductive cycles. But in general, the uh, soma only needs to hang around long enough to make sure that the offspring will survive, and then it can die. So these are the only intergenerational travelers in multicellular organisms. These are the only ones that really get to reproduce uh, ad libitum and go on to the next generation. So multicellularity requires cooperation. You have to have division of labor. Um, uh, you have to transport resources and allocate them. You have to maintain um, the tissues and the extracellular environment. But again, multicellular organisms are composed of uh, cells that have all descended from unicellular organisms that want only to eat, divide, eat, divide. They still want to do that. They have those programs in the background. Those programs have to be shut off in favor of um, the newer programs that fulfill the goals of the larger multicellular uh, creature. So wayward cells, if a cell decides, hey, I want to go back to the way it was uh, when I was a bacterium, it's executed. And uh, uh, 
if that uh, execution fails for some reason, uh, cancer can result. So let's talk about something called Pito's paradox. Pito was a biologist, uh, I believe in the 1970s. He noticed that large animals with all of their cells and their long lives uh, should always get cancer because they're um, uh, at risk. And small animals should rarely get cancer. But as we've learned, elephants rarely get cancer, mice usually do, and humans are in between. So why is that? You may know that large dogs are very prone to cancer, and most will succumb to cancer between the ages of five and eight, whereas small dogs do get cancer, but uh, they usually have a long life and live to be uh, you know, anywhere from 12 to, to 20 years old. Same in people. These are from a family in Ecuador uh, that have a genetic variant called Laron dwarfism. They do not get cancer. They do not get diabetes. They don't actually live any longer than anyone else. Their lifespans are normal, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, but they don't succumb to those two diseases. The reason um, uh, for this is uh, 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 that within a species is that smaller body sizes and uh, fewer cell divisions lead to less opportunity for DNA replication errors, and we'll talk more about this uh, uh, in, the, in the future, but this is only within a species. So within a species, a large specimen is worse off in terms of cancer uh, than a smaller one, and that goes for humans as well. And the reason for that is, uh, part of the reason for that is, so we think, a hormone called IGF-1. Uh, this is the link between cancer risk and size within a species. And um, uh, uh, there are different versions of this in Chihuahuas and Great Danes. There are different versions of this in humans with uh, Laurent dwarfism and other humans. Um, and, uh, oops, there we go, sorry. Um, so again, Pito's paradox, just to review again, why is there a lack of correlation between body size and cancer incidence between species and not within species? And the answer is, is that the soma uh, um, uh, deteriorates with age. The soma requires constant surveillance, uh, communication. The uh, wayward members have to be executed. The intruders have to be expelled or murdered or contained. There's got to be transportation of uh, uh, resources throughout the soma. Waste has to be removed. There has to be eating uh, and metabolism. There's landscaping. The pH has to be kept nice and comfortable. The hydration, oxygenation, the microbiota have to be kept in check. Uh, the uh, specimen has to be prepared and beautified for courtship. Um, injuries have to be repaired. DNA has to be repaired. Um, this is so expensive that it is kept up only until reproduction has been completed or the reproductive age has passed and all chance for reproduction is over. So by that time, the question of who gets to reproduce, who is fit, uh, has been answered and the soma maintenance or lack thereof no longer influences the next generation. And does that make sense? If you're not reproducing um, and the soma deteriorates with age, you cannot have that affect um, um, the evolution of the species. So there are ways to slow this process down. It's mediated mainly by things like inflammation um, uh, and intermittent fasting, caloric restriction, maybe metformin. These things are all being looked at, um, I think, by a lot of you folks uh, to see if uh, these might help. Um, cancer, however, is pretty much a, a given for an organism that's uh, aging once the soma gets old enough. And that's because cancer is a disease of gene, genes and gene expression. So DNA can be damaged. Um, it, it can acquire inappropriate epigenetic tags or lose uh, epigenetic tags that it should have. Uh, this can happen with external factors or internal factors. So just living, breathing, metabolizing, eating causes DNA damage. So um, I want you to take a look. Um, uh, we're going to talk, we're going to spend some time here on DNA repair. So uh, um, DNA damage is usually repaired pretty quickly. Um, there are a million DNA damage events per day per cell by some estimations. Now, the, this varies 
by tissue and by organism and by all sorts of things, but this is a, you know, uh, this, this is a reasonable number for a lot of uh, tissues. And the, there is an error rate in repair of DNA or just plain old division. And it's um, uh, 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the ten, minus 10th. And if the repair is incomplete, the cell is either executed or put into a dormant, non-dividing state. So I'm going to bring you back to fitness again. And fitness has nothing to do with strength or muscles or health or longevity. It has to do with the ability to reproduce in our definition of fitness in evolution. So the more fit a cell is in a tissue compared to others in the tissue, the more likely it is to cause a cancer. In other words, I'm going to say that in a different way. The more able a cell is to divide within a particular situation in a tissue, the more likely it is to be able to cause a cancer. So in an adult organism, once growth is over with, increasing the fitness of a single cell is not necessarily a good idea. Um, and any mutation which uh, does this is something to worry about. So an organism as it's, or a species as it's evolving um, can decrease its cancer risk by decreasing the mutation rate. Um, or increasing its repair capacity. Now, you can decrease the mutation rate um, by having a short lifespan, which requires that you reproduce very early uh, because you've got to get your uh, childbearing in. Uh, you can have a, you could decrease the mutation rate by having, being small. You can decrease your metabolic rate by eating less, decreasing your body temperature, um, and you can avoid mutagens. Well, humans can do a lot of these things. Animals don't necessarily uh, do these things. But we're going to get back to elephants, and I'm going to give you a hint here. Um, what if you increased uh, the activity or number of your DNA repair genes or their accuracy? Now, that would improve uh, the uh, mutation rate. So that's what elephants do. They actually have 20 copies of the TP53 gene, which is a tumor suppressor. It uh, uh, is involved in the repair of DNA damage. Humans have only one copy of this gene, and mice only have one copy. So of course, one of the first things, when this was discovered, one of the first things that was tried was to insert artificially into mice several copies of the TP53 gene. It did work. It decreased tumor formation. But it also increased aging, and the mice didn't live any longer. So um, that still needs, that strategy needs some work, apparently. So um, uh, life strategy is uh, involved in cancer risk. And uh, the life strategy of the mouse, because it has such a lo short lifespan, is to reproduce fast and massively and hope some of the young survive and then to die. Elephants uh, uh, have a different life strategy. They grow very large. They mature late. They have very few young, and they take exquisite care of them. So most of them do survive. Um, so the elephant requires a lot of P53 um, because it has to maintain this huge soma over a long, over many decades. So who gets to reproduce or can I divide now is a question each cell in your body is always asking its neighbors. Is it my turn? Is it my turn? Is it my turn? Well, it's not their turn unless they're the germ cells and there's only, you know, not very many of those. So it's a bad lottery and, uh, you know, on a certain level, there is a pressure within each cell to escape from um, the constraints of being part of this multicellular organism, go its own way, and go back to uh, being a happy little immortal bacterium. Um, so um, uh, in youth, this process is heavily suppressed. There are a lot of checks and, and uh, blocks and obstacles to unwanted division in young multicellular organisms. And that's good because most of the DNA mutations that are going to occur, when does, when, does DNA, when does DNA mutate? It mutates when it's dividing. When are cells dividing? When you're a fetus, mainly. I mean, there's this huge, you turn from, you know, a one-celled organism to an egg and a, and a sperm into, you know, however many cells there are by the time um, uh, you're born. Um, and in, in uh, 50 percent of all mutations occur by the time you reach maturity, age 20. Uh, all, 50, half of the mutations that you're going to have in your lifetime are, are there then. 
And um, most young people don't get cancer. There are cancers in, in children, even babies, and um, uh, that's, a whole, uh, that's a whole different talk, but um, uh, uh, that's because so many of these mutations can occur very, very early in life. So aging permits the emergence of emergence of fitter cells. And remember what the definition of fitness is. It's the ability to reproduce, the propensity to reproduce. So um, aging tissues uh, have a decrease in their tissue oxygen levels, blood flow. Um, there are um, uh, important changes in the glucose and insulin levels with aging. Uh, and uh, maintaining and suppressing these changes is very expensive. What also I want you to take away from this, if nothing else, is that tumor suppression decreases fertility. And that is why these tumor suppression genes, uh, uh, mutations in tumor suppression genes that cause cancer remain in the gene pool. It's because people with some of these mutations actually are much more fertile and reproduce uh, more. And an example of this is the BRCA mutation, which all of you have heard of. Uh, the mutation results in decreased activity of a DNA repair gene related to the TP53 uh, gene that we saw in the elephants. It's called P53. And uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, carriers, human carriers of this, both male and female, have more children and have them earlier. We have no idea why that is, um, uh, but cancer, as you know, is very frequent in BRCA mutation carriers, cancers of all so sorts, although it was first discovered in breast cancer. So what oncology needs to do is to drive the um, uh, fitness of cancer cells in the direction that is beneficial to the patient. And we can learn a lot from um, what's called integrated pest management in agriculture, where the ecology is uh, uh, engineered to a certain extent to increase predators of a pest, to decrease food supply of a pest, rather than just blanket, um, uh, blanketing the pests with some sort of pesticide, which can engender resistance, uh, uh, these uh, uh, maneuvers will often be much more successful in the long term. So what is resistance? I'm talking about resistance. It's the ability to survive an intervention designed to kill you. Okay, so we have insecticide resistance, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, herbicide resistance in um, uh, plants. Resistance is produced by selection pressure. It can evolve naturally because of spontaneous mutations. We can cause it, and we often do, when we treat cancer. So. Um, we do that by exposing a cancer cell population to a large, continuous dose of treatment. So in the wild, in a situation when we're talking about cancer now, um, but it would also work with, with insects, any resistance that you carry around, you're dragging around, if you're a cell and you're dragging around a resistance machine, that's expensive. That's going to take away from your ability to reproduce. You're gonna need resources to build the machine. You're gonna re need resources to maintain it. Um, it's basically um, a drag and prevents you from reproducing as quickly. It's uh, uh, one of um, uh, uh, the uh, proponents of this theory says that um, an umbrella is a burden unless it's raining. So um, uh, you can think about resistance as, as an umbrella. It's great when it's raining, and it's horrible when it's, uh, when it's dry and sunny. So resistant cells are always in the minority in a cancer, and uh, that's important. We'll get to why that's important later. So let's talk about a very common cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, not prostate cancer in general. I'm talking about metastatic prostate cancer here is incurable with current treatment. So evolutionary approaches which don't provide a cure, but might keep the patient alive and without symptoms of cancer are now being looked at. And I think that's a wonderful thing to really uh, change our goals from curing and killing all the, curing the patient by killing all of the cancer cells or treating the patient so that the patient remains healthy and lives with cancer. Basically, most of us are living with cancer our entire lives and we just keep it suppressed. If the patient needs a little help keeping it suppressed from the outside, um, I think that uh, might be worth looking into. So the prostate gland sits just below the bladder in the male. Um, it's about the size of a walnut. You'll note that the urethra 
goes straight through the prostate gland. So if the prostate gland is ill and swollen, uh, the patient will have trouble urinating and they will complain of a full bladder and a slow stream. It's not always a sign of cancer, but it can be. This is a, a dissection of an, a normal, two normal prostate glands. They've been removed from the body, but they haven't been cut in two. You can see the urethra um, uh, going through uh, uh, the, a potential space for the urethra right there. You can see the open urethra here in this specimen. So that's what a normal prostate looks like. This is a prostate that's been sectioned and has a cancer on the right side of the screen. Um, and you can see it, that yellow, yellowest tissue there. And you can see the urethra in the middle. Um, so, so you can stay oriented. So a cancer in the prostate gland is not fatal. The prostate gland can be removed. What kills patients is metastasis. Prostate cancer tends to metastasize first to bone. This is a patient with a, uh, metastases in several areas of the bone, those black spots there. Um, this uh, area down here is just the bladder filled with some of the contrast. That's not a cancer. So prostate cancer patients can be monitored with a blood test called the PSA. It, uh, as the blood test goes up and down, that tells us whether the number of prostate cancer cells in the body is going up and down respectively. Um, so here we have again the cancer. We want to avoid resistance when we treat this patient with metastatic prostate cancer. If we wanted to engineer resistance, what would we do? We'd give the patient the biggest dose as often as possible and for as long as possible. And that is uh, what is currently done in most prostate, metastatic prostate cancer uh, cases. Now I want to take a segue here, and a detour, and say that maximum tolerated dose is important in curable cancers. And I've listed some of the um, uh, curable cancers. This is not an exhaustive list, but if your oncologist says, hey, we've got treatment that can cure this cancer and it requires maximum tolerated dose, please, please listen to them. Um, and I want to especially say in pediatric cancers, 85% of pediatric cancers can be cured even if they're advanced. So uh, you don't want to, to miss out on, on a cure. Um, but in general, the common cancers of late adulthood uh, are not curable when they're metastatic. And uh, maybe we should be abandoning curative attempts in this situation. Because in this situation, we're usually making things worse. So I've mentioned that the standard treatment of metastatic prostate cancer is, is a, a treatment at maximum tolerated dose. What's done is testosterone is removed from the body. It used to be done by removing the testicles. It was called castration. Um, and uh, now we give drugs. It's still called castration. We call it chemical castration. I, uh, it's a horrible term, um, but I guess it's true. So the goal is to remove all the testosterone from the cancer ecosystem because a lot of prostate cancer cells will grow in the presence of testosterone, but not all of them. Some of them have a resistance mechanism. Because that resistance is expensive when there's no treatment, they are in the minority, but they're there. So if we treat a prostate cancer patient, the, at first the PSA goes down, the bone scan gets better, um, things look great. This, uh, and we've gone with the idea that we're going to just kill them all. This is Xena, warrior princess. This was one of her favorite sayings. And what do we actually have happening here? We have um, uh, the sense treatment that uh, testosterone dependent cells are purple, okay? You see that they're in the great majority at the, before we start treatment. There are a few little green resistant cells um, there. And then we give some treatment. They, and this is called MAC, MTD, stands for maximum tolerated dose. We give treatment. Wow, the tumor shrinks. The uh, PSA goes down, we're really happy. Um, but what's really going on there? If you count the uh, cells, even though the whole tumor is smaller, the resistant cells, the green ones, have expanded in number. Things are getting worse in terms of resistance. And the same as you go along uh, toward the right, uh, you can see that the treatment is given um, uh, at regular intervals and the resistant uh, cell population continues to grow, and eventually we've wiped out all of the purple cells. All we're left with is uh, green cells, and uh, 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 the therapy stops working. Oh, it looks like I've got one minute. I missed my five minutes, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so what's worse than uh, treatable prostate cancer cells? Well, untreatable ones. So what if we use game ther ther 
uh, theory. Um, game theory is a type of uh, branch of mathematics that uh, uh, utilizes uh, uh, strategies to maximize the desired outcome in a competitive situation. If we give adaptive therapy small doses infrequently and only as needed to remove or decrease symptoms, we end up, we hope, with a healthy patient who's alive but does have cancer, uh, theoretically. Um, here's what it looks like. You notice that the purple cells uh, uh, remain throughout this treatment schema. There's only two treatments given, and at the end, the tumor is no bigger, um, and most of the purple cells uh, remain. So this actually worked in, um, do you want to go to questions now? I have about three more minutes. Um, should I can carry on? Okay. Um, so uh, it actually worked, uh, those were mathematical modelings, but it actually worked in a real trial. Um, 11 patients were given adaptive therapy for metastatic prostate cancer. 16 patients were given standard high dose therapy. And the adaptive therapy worked. Only one of the 11 patients uh, had worsening disease uh, while on adaptive therapy, and 14 of the, patients, of the 16 patients on standard therapy uh, got worse. And more studies are planned. So um, this is a t uh, a real, my favorite equation in mathematics. This is a tic-tac-toe board, and tic-tac-toe can be described as a combinatorial game, and the idea is to force a double bind so that wherever you... Um, uh, put a, a treatment, uh, the resistance development actually makes you more sensitive if you're a cancer cell to the next treatment. So there have been double bind attempts in human cancer with uh, alternating of estrogen therapy and estrogen deprivation in metastatic breast cancer. There have been the similar trials with testosterone, giving testosterone and then withdrawing it. Um, and blocking testosterone activity in metastatic prostate cancer with limited success. It's promising, um, and research needs to go on. So I will, everybody gets these slides, right? Yeah, okay, so um, I will um, uh, let you read the summaries here at your own time, but basically what I wanna say is that increasing fitness of a cell in old age is bad because it allows it to reproduce and that can lead to cancer. Um, this soma is not maintained very well, anyway, after reproductive years, and so you want to take special care of it. Uh, you can uh, fast, you can um, uh, try some drugs, metformin exercise, uh, we don't know, but things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy may have a role. Um, if you end up with a, an incurable cancer, you might want to seek out some adaptive therapy approaches, and the ultimate goal of evolutionary cancer therapy is to create a therapeutic double bind wherein the development of resistance to one drug confers susceptibility to a second drug. Thank you very much. There's references and um, things on there. Great job, Don, thank you so much. Um, it's 10.25, we have to wrap up at 10.30, so we have five minutes, we can get a couple questions in. Hi, thanks for that. Sure. Uh, so my name is Andre Angel and Tony, and I'm the project lead for the vaccine course. I have a poster I'm inviting you to come see on vaccine-induced okay. autoimmunities. I'd love for you to come see it. But my, um, I asked someone on the team to go through all the section 13s of all the product inserts of the vaccines. We did that for 73 of them. And we found that none of them had been tested for long-term carcinogenicity, and that about 60% of the vaccines contain aluminum salts. So we tell people not to use antiperspirant because it's aluminum, because that might cause breast cancer, but we're using, we're injecting the aluminum in all of us. Why is the FDA not requiring long-term carcinogenicity testing of these drugs? So that's a really good question. I'm not a vaccine specialist, and um, uh, long-term carcinogenicity testing is um, extremely expensive. It would take probably several generations and uh, more than the uh, gross national product. Um, so um, that might be a reason, but again, that's not my area of expertise, so I would defer to, to maybe to you to, to, to help answer that question. Okay. I, and would you recommend we remove the aluminum from the vaccines? Again, I'd have to look at the, the whole situation. I'll come and take a look at your poster. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, how you doing? Uh, thank you, that was a very interesting talk. Can you elaborate on why you would potentially see an increase in aging with increased uh, tumor suppressor genes in the mice? 
Yeah, so um, if you have uh, increased tumor suppression, one of the mechanisms of tumor suppression is apoptosis, programmed cell death. So you're ordering the execution of a lot of damaged cells. So a lot of these cells are damaged but still functioning somewhat in the aged, aged uh, uh, individual. Um, killing them off would decrease, uh, uh, you know, would re eliminate that function which could decrease their, their viability. You ended up <clears throat> on a point that you, you made twice. Um, increased health <clears throat> in, uh, equals increased uh, propensity for cancer, <clears throat> which makes me um, question. Increased fitness, not increased yeah. health. Okay, fitness, fitness and health are different. Okay, okay. Fitness then. has only to do with the ability to reproduce. Has nothing to do with health. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, then, then, there, then there's, I might be saved after all then, because <laughs> my, um, my um, uh, nutrient smoothies that my wife reminds me I'm perhaps doing myself harm, may actually be doing myself harm, making myself more fit, perhaps. So uh, again, fitness in this, uh, the definition of fitness as used in evolutionary context has nothing to do with, with general health of an individual. It has to do with their ability to reproduce. Uh, well, I'm trying to bring this down into a practical statement for me to consume and, and take action on. Uh, so if you could maybe give some actionable advice. But uh, sometimes when practitioners discover things in the lab, you ask the practitioner, well, what are you doing now that you have this information? So ma'am, what are you doing? So I'm a big proponent of intermittent fasting, and um, I think that that's probably important. I also use in my clinic uh, drugs like metformin in cancer patients um, with incurable metastatic cancers in, in hopes of improving the um, uh, uh, tissue landscape. Make it rejuvenating it a bit. Um, we use things that um, decrease inflammation. There are drugs that do that. Uh, intermittent fasting helps with that. Um, things like fish oil can do that in some people. Now, fish oil will increase cancer in um, uh, certain Norwegian men who have a particular uh, genotype. So um, you want to look into that before you start taking fish oil to decrease inflammation if you're worried about prostate cancer. But um, Things have to be individualized to a certain extent, but the main point I want to make, and I hope I've made it here, is that fitness in the evolutionary sense does not equal health, and they're different, and they're, you're asking a different question. You're asking what will make me healthy, and I'm talking about um, what will um, make a cell uh, reproduce. You're saying you're getting healthier, your cells are going to be more fit. No, right? not in the evolutionary terms. So I want to separate again, the, def the evolutionary definition of fitness has only to do with the ability to reproduce. So if you're talking to a PE teacher, fitness means something different than if you're talking to an evolutionarius, an evolutionary scientist. But, but physical fitness will get a child to survive childhood and to live to the age of reproduction. Physical fitness is not evolutionary fitness, though. No, I, I yeah. absolutely know that. Yeah, okay. Let me, let me say that physical fitness is good, okay? <laughs> physical fitness is good. Evolutionary fitness is sometimes good, but not if you're an aging cell and an aging tissue. Then it can be bad. But if there's no physical fitness beyond childhood to get you to the age of reproduction, you will not be evolutionary fit because you won't live to the age of reproduction. There you go. Okay, so I, I think that might be unclear. I, I mean, that's okay. what I We're talking about the fitness of an entity in its environment. So we, we are at our time, so I think if you guys want to, you know, continue discussing the details of that, you can after. Thank you, Don.